Thank you, Henry, for all the great job. Let's give a hand to our administrative director. Great job. Holy Spirit, invite you to speak to us as we release the children today. Bless them, touch them in a mighty way. Amen. Children, if you can sneak out quietly to your upper room, your teachers are waiting for you. Today we continue our series on fearless. Fearless. This is what we have done so far. We have we talked about seven reasons why we should not fear based on Isaiah 43. Then we talk about the fear of failure. Then we talk about fear of rejection, part one and two. We've looked at the fear of death, the fear of soul winning. Last week, we looked at the fear of man. Today is a heavy one. We are going to look at the fear of intimacy. I want to dedicate this sermon especially to Sister Theo and Stephen on your 25th anniversary. May God take you to a deeper level in your relationship. We are proud of you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. We celebrate marriages because we believe marriages work. Amen. Amen. Fear of intimacy. Fear of intimacy. What, what is that? It is a fear of being emotionally or spiritually close to another person. So we're going to look at both at the emotional level and even more so at the spiritual level. The problem with this fear is that it affects our intimacy with God. When you struggle with that intimacy with people, unfortunately, it affects our intimacy with God. It's a problem that we all have wrestled with it. We all struggle with it. The fear of intimacy. We get that in friendships. We get that in marriages. You find that among families, siblings, dad, and daughter, daughter, and mom. You find that even among Christian circles. Some of you, you are afraid. That is why when the service ends, you run through the door. Because you are afraid that somebody might say hello to you and make you uncomfortable. Then obviously our fear of intimacy with God. The Bible says we are created for intimacy. And we are most human when we are connected at a very deep level with one another and with God. Did you just hear me? We are created for intimacy, and we are most human, not even Christian, we are most human when we are connected at a very deep level with one another and with God. When that is missing, it leaves a brokenness and a fear. Erwin McManus, in one of his books, it's a very good book, Soul uh, Cravings, it's called Soul Cravings, he said, we are most alive when we find it, talk about intimacy, most devastated when we lose it, most empty when we give up on it, most inhuman when we betray it, and most passionate when we pursue it. Like I said, every one of us in this room, one, one way or the other, have been touched by this, this subject of intimacy. So three areas I want to talk about very quickly. Very quick outline, very simple outline. We're going to look at the causes. Why do we have this fear? The consequences, then we're going to look at the cure. Are you ready? If you don't mind, just bring out your bulletin, um, your notes, your sermon notes, and follow me. Let's start with the first one, the causes. Why do we have this fear? For starters, we have to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It started with Adam. Our fear of intimacy began from the garden. It's inherited. 
Every child that is born begins with some woundedness in that, that area. Even psychologists say when kids are born, they need to be breastfed because that is the first place where through the breast milk that they learn about intimacy. There have been studies done that say that children who are not breastfed have issues with intimacy because that is where bonding takes place. That is where they are first introduced to intimacy. Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and the wife, and were not ashamed. This is the height of intimacy. There's no fear. There's no shame. There's no self-consciousness. There's no barriers. I don't care if I'm naked. I mean, they were at that height with one another. But of course, it didn't stay that way until sin came in. Go back to chapter th three. The Bible said when they sinned, at that moment, their eyes were open. This is where our problem began. And they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. All of a sudden, Adam couldn't look at Eve anymore. So they sow thick leaves together to cover themselves. And ever since then, we have been covering ourselves. We are scared. We are afraid. We are afraid to be hurt. We are afraid that if you see my nakedness, you are going to look at me differently. Maybe you may not love me that much. So we cover. We cover in church. We cover in our marriages. We cover in our families. Fathers don't even know anymore how to express intim intimacy to their children anymore. We are scared. We are scared that if you see our nakedness, it makes us... Are you still okay? Can, can I keep on? You're too quiet. Is that all right? We might be vulnerable. Fear of intimacy has everything to do with vulnerability. Naked but ashamed. God needs to bring us to naked but not ashamed. Began with Adam. Then obviously it continues. The second cause is abandonment. And mostly I want to express it from home. When we grow up in a home where intimacy is not expressed, or let me say it is not model, we don't know how to do it. I grew up as an African, and I believe I speak to a lot of other cultures as well, where intimacy was a very huge problem for me and for most African men, African women. We just don't know how. It was a model. We don't even know how it looks like. And it sometimes can create some awkwardness. When we are confronted with it, we realize that we have to, but we don't know how. When we don't see model by our parents, or even more so, when our parents separate, part of the separation anxiety that children go through is a fear of intimacy. They see mom and dad, and they see mom, mom and dad quarrel, they fight. And that's why I tell couples, one of the worst things you could do to your children is fight in front of them. You have no idea the kind of anxiety you create in the heart of your children. It can be done. My children never saw us even exchange bad words or even fight in our life. Because we made it a, a mass. We will fight, but we will fight fairly. We will fight somewhere. We will choose a place to, for our fight. Right, my dear? But not in front of them. Even if the fight is boiling, my wife will blink at me. There's a kid in the house. And I blink and say, we'll continue somewhere. <laughs> because the kids are not part of the collateral damage of the, our misgivings. Or... So let me encourage couples, if you have been doing it, stop it. You create unnecessary anxiety for your children. Or even when a divorce happens, that is even the worst of it. Or when children lose their parents at a very young age. 
they struggle with it. They struggle with it. And in the process, we develop trust issues that is coming right from home, mother, father issues or mother issues. David, when you read the Psalms carefully, David was a man who wrestled with this as well. And the reason why I'm saying that those trust issues can be projected to God is when we can't trust people, we don't trust God. In fact, it's not like you become a Christian and you can switch it on. All of a sudden, you are intimate with God. No. When you have intimacy with everybody, you have intimacy with problem with God. You can't just switch it on because the spirit and the emotions are interconnected. So when you find out, you, are, you find it difficult even to accept the love of God, to get close to God, it's possible you have a fear of intimacy. There are people in the Bible, they couldn't get too close to God because it made them uncomfortable and it makes them too vulnerable. There was a point Jesus even showed himself to Peter and did some, some wonderful thing. And it, Peter looked at him and said, you got to go, just leave me alone. Just go. I'm a sinner. I can't, I can't handle this. Are you still with me? I'm going to be very careful with this message because I know that it's a, it's a very sore area. Psalm 27, he said, do not leave me now. Don't abandon me, O God of my salvation. Even my father and my mother abandon me. The Lord will hold me close. He said, God, I feel it. Please, you don't leave me. You see, we, we have that think, type of thinking that if my father and my mother leaves me, God will leave me too. I, my trust issue come packaged with my relationship with God. I can't trust God. I can't trust so that he will be there for me. He will not going to leave me like the other person left me. And that's why I'm saying that the, 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 the issue with intimacy affects us at a very deep spiritual level. I remember when I first came to North America, this is where one of the gifts North America gave me is to teach me how to love God. I could pray. I could cast demons. I could do everything. But I had issues with intimacy with God. I remember one day at our graduate school, we were sitting in a circle and, and we were asked to pray. And being fresh from Africa, my prayer is always warfare. Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority in the air, on the ground, and under the ground. Any spirit, I declare this, this school as a no flying zone. And everybody was quiet. And I was still, I was praying. When I finished praying, this lady on, on my right started to pray. She said, Jesus, how much I love you. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> and she started to cry. And unconsciously, tears began to flow in my eyes. I've never had that kind of relationship with God. My relationship with God is either he's a gas station. I go there for anointing and gas and off my way for power. I didn't know how to stop and really... Just love him. I left that place convicted. I said, I have to learn. I remember going home and we were praying with my wife, and she looked at me and said, What, what happened to you? <laughs> I'm getting into intimacy. If my father and my mother abandons me, God is not my mother and my father is not going to abandon me. The fear of intimacy also can come obviously from abuse when you have been mistreated, you have been hurt, you have been disappointed, you gave your heart to somebody and the person treated as nothing. From that moment on, whether you like it or not, we make a conscious effort to protect it. And some of us, we have never again moments in our life where we said, I will never put my heart in a place where my heart can be handled this way, consciously and unconsciously. And let me tell you something God was telling me. Sometimes we make those decisions, and sometimes we don't even know how to turn it on. Some of you got married, you have kids, but you still don't know how to open the door for your husband. 
Somebody told me the other day, said, Pastor, I just don't know how. I love my husband, but it's been so long, I can't even find the key to open it. I want to love my husband. I want to let him in, but the door has been shut so deep, so hard, I can't do it. It will take only God to come in and reopen the door that has been shut for all these years. Am I talking to somebody? We are talking about when you have been disappointed and gone through something. It's, it pr- brings you in that situation. Even if you want to, you are so scared to, to go there. Can you imagine this woman? The classic case, the woman at the well. She has been married five times. And the sixth husband was in the husband because she had decided never again. So when she meets Jesus, she's living with this man and just have just refused to cross the line. Five times, enough. I've seen all of them. I've seen that their type. I've married different colors, some with afro, some with bald hair. I've seen them all. Can I get a witness? And when a man comes and says, hello, he says, I have seen your kind. Back off. And Jesus said, the one that you are living with, you are not married with. And he said, yeah, you bet you're right. I'm not going there anymore. Abuse can cause us to close that door because we are so afraid. Job chapter 19, he expressed this thing I'm talking about. Job said, all my intimate friends detest me. Those I loved have turned against me. This is a man expressing the, the, the abuse and disappointment that comes as a result of giving your heart and trusting somebody. Sometimes it's what I call abdication. Abdication is simply for some of you, you are just afraid to lose control. I'm afraid that if I give my heart to somebody, I'll be so vulnerable that I'll lose control. I need to always be in control. And intimacy means being naked and not be ashamed. And I'm not sure, Pastor, I'm ready for that. No, 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 I can't, I can't. I want to be covered. Because there I have control on who sees me and who does not see me. Are you still with me? Abdication has to do with control. If I fall in love, it means I'm going to lose control. And somebody is going to get my heart and can manipulate it and treat it the way you are. Of course, love brings you vulnerability. But the fact is that many of us are not ready to be that vulnerable. They said that then there is an anxiety. There's a certain form of anxiety, which is a medical condition. I thought I should let you know. Because we are dealing with all aspects. It is, some of you may have heard it. It is called avoidance personality disorder. How I many of you have heard that? It's not your fault. It's just when there's a chemical imbalance, it's an anxiety disorder, that just makes us afraid to go deeper. Maybe nobody's hurt you. It's just the imbalance around inside you. And some, it can be treated by medication. Others, most importantly, by prayer. Just, I'm just... When I get close to people, I feel very, very anxious. And they are not able to maintain relationship. Are you still with me? Now let's look at the consequences. What does this do to you and to others around you? The the consequence. First of all, it makes you very indifferent. In other words, you can be in a relationship and your emotional walls may be so high and so tall so tall and so thick that even the walls of China cannot be compared to it. It's like I've got a concrete wall, I've got a steel wall, I've got every wall, and when you hit it, you know that you you are hitting it because this person doesn't care. You can love me all you want, but you're not coming in. I know some of you know what I'm talking about. When you meet people who are very indifferent to love. Their hearts are guarded. There is a sense of resistance. And if you push it, you are going to get a pushback. I told you we should just be as friends. 
you are going somewhere that you are not allowed to go. And if you push it, you are going to lose me. I'm not going there. When Jesus met the woman at the well, that was obvious. There was immediate pushback. I know your kind. I know your sort. I'm not even interested in having a conversation with you because this is where it all starts. They all come like that. And before I know it, they are chopping my heart into pieces. You become very indifferent. Sometimes, like I said, even when you come to the point where you want to open your heart, you can't do it anymore. And people who have fear of intimacy, sometimes they have what I, they, they experience what I call a self-imposed isolation. I have decided to isolate myself. I don't care. I don't want it. I am just fine. Pastor, I am just fine. I don't need intimacy to be alive. In fact, I have lived like this for 30 years and I'm not about to let somebody break my heart again. It is called self-imposed isolation. I'm not going there. I'll never go there. Even if somebody comes in the form of Jesus, I'm not going there. The heart is shut. Very indifferent. I know, I, I know you're out there. I know you're out there. It causes indifference. It also causes insecurity. You see, when somebody is experiencing rejection and disappointment and hurt, even divorce, any woman who has been through divorce will tell you, it makes you feel second class. You don't think you are worth it. And part of your fear is that you don't think that somebody will love you enough and deeply. And if you do open your heart, they are going to walk away like the rest did. No, no, no. You can't love me. No, no, no. You are just, you are just playing around me. So I'm not going to open my heart. I cannot trust you to love me. And obviously it's spilled into our God issues and we, we wrestle with that. The insecurity. Now this is the worst. The third consequence is we become very inconsiderate. You know, when somebody is shut their heart, let me come closer to you so I can see your, your eyes. Is that okay? When people shut their heart and you try to push it, it becomes very annoying to them. Very annoying. If you keep pushing, they become very angry. So don't push it. Your love, in fact, annoys them. Your love, in fact, reminds them about their pain. Instead of your love drawing them closer, whether it's a husband, wife, a brother, a sister, your love seems to push them away. That's the reason, because there are consequences. You are reminding them about the door that they have shut, places that they don't want to go. And the more you pour your love to them, the more they run. They become angry sometimes. They can become critical. You're like, what is wrong with this man? The more I love him, the more he becomes angry. You know why? You are pushing him. He doesn't want to go there. I'm sorry, I should have prepared you last week, right? Some of you find that you're in the cage. Oh boy, can I run away? Ushers, lock the door. Nobody's getting out. I could feel the tension in the room. So okay, you can look at the eyes of your friend or your husband and say, turn to somebody and say, we'll be fine, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. We'll just be fine. I warned you from the beginning, so it's okay, it's okay. We will land very smoothly. Right now we are 35,000 feet above sea level. Very soon we're going to land. It's going to be all right. Are you still with me? Come annoyed. Have you met people like that? Your love annoys them. Why are you calling me? Why are you testing me? Why are you loving me? Why are you buying me the gift? I told you I don't need your love. I don't need your gift. Take it away. Sometimes they can even become abusive. Even the worst ones are the, the passive aggressors. They don't show any emotion, but you can tell. They are telling you, back off. They're not showing any emotion. Just nothing. I love you, Nothing. You buy them a gift, no response. You approach them, nothing. They are sending you a message. 
I'm not going there. You can buy me the whole world. I'm not going there with you. It's the same problem where a lot of men in this church are afraid to get married. Don't look at me in some ways. <laughs> Turn to a man and said, I can see it in your eyes. You are afraid. You will talk to anybody. The lady just simply said, can we hang out? No! No! I don't do hanging out. No, just hang out. No! No, 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 no. Stay away from me. Hello, brother. No! I'm afraid of you. <laughs> Eventually, what they would do, they would sabotage the relationship. You know, sir, there are people who are good at it. They will, they will do everything to push you away. And if you don't do it, if you don't get a message, if you don't get a message, they will break up with you. So there are people in this church today, you get in a relationship, when it gets too close, you break it up. Find another relationship, get too close, you break it up. You have a PhD in breakup. <laughs> Say, Pastor, what is wrong with me? When this man comes close, I run. You have a fear of intimacy. You're afraid that you cannot trust them, cannot trust their love. They will hurt you. But today in this house, there's healing for you in Jesus' name. God, Israel had that problem, by the way. The children of Israel had that problem. They've come out from a place where they be, there was abuse. They treat them like nothing. They were nobodies. God bring them from Egypt, try to love them. And there was almost a rook awakening that these people, they would just push back. The whole book of Hosea is about how God is trying to love his people. And they keep saying, no way, Jose. So, so, so watch it in chapter 11. It said, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And I called my son out of Egypt. But the more I called to him, what happened? The father, he moved from me. This is a classic case of the fear of intimacy. Israel could not handle the love of God because they've been oppressed for so long, they've shut their heart, and even if they want to, they cannot. So God tells Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. So Hosea goes and marry a prostitute, bring the prostitute home. God wants it. let me tell you what is happening to Israel. Marries a prostitute, he even had kids with the prostitute. One day he comes home and she was gone. Where? Going from house to house. Where is my lover? Where is, oh, we saw her with this Mr. This, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson said, well, he just came here for two hours. She's going to see Mr. Smith. She was all over the place. And Uzziah said, go find her and bring her back. The heart of God was bleeding. And it's a very classic case of many of us in this room who will know exactly what I'm talking about. You will do everything to receive love and to get your loved one back. Help me, Jesus. The other side of the consequences, obviously, is indulgence. When you don't open your heart for intimacy, you're on a very dangerous ground because you enter into false intimacy. Because like I told you from the beginning, God created us for intimacy. One way or the other, you will find it somewhere. So guess where these men who don't want to get married, guess where they go? Prostitutes and pornography. That's where they get their fix. Oh, yeah. Most of these men, they struggle with masturbation. They are finding the intimacy. Of course, some women too, not all men struggle with pornography. It's across the genders. You'll find it somewhere. You are finding intimacy because it's safe. You are not connected to that woman. You are not connected to that picture. You can do your thing and move away. There is no ties. This girl, if I say hello to her, she'll be calling me, testing me. I remember one young man came and I was really encouraging him to try. So he tried. One day he come and said, Pastor, I'm tired. I said, why? I said, I just spent three hours with the girl. I finally got home 
and she called me, she wants to talk again. Ah, it's too much. Somebody said too much, oh. Say it's too much. Pastor, is that what intimacy is? I have to talk to her. And when she sent me a test, and I wait five minutes, she thinks I'm breaking up. Why not respond to my test? Why? Blim, 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 blim. Oh no, enough, too much. Ladies, please slow it down. Slow it down, slow it down. Some of the men, they need one step at a time. If she responds to your test three days, that is, that, that is good. We can't handle it. So we go to places, either it's pornography or we go to alcohol, or we go to even entertainment. Have you, met, have you realized that some of us, especially the ladies, our first intimacy may be all the shows in the world. We have watched all the shows on NBC. Because that's where we get our fix. We just want to go home, put our feet up, and tend to watch all the series. And we are crying in between. I can't believe she just left him. Oh. No, wait, wait. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. I can't wait to go home to see series number four. Okay, I'll stop it. I stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I told you we'll land. So I'm, I'm, I'm about to land. I'm about to land. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible is for my people have committed, have done two evil things, committed two evil. They have forced, abandoned me, the fountain of living water. And they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that cannot hold water at all. When you run away, abandon either from God or from people, you are going to have cracked systems. Pornography are not intimacy. They are false intimacy. They cannot hold water. And that's what Jesus told that woman at the well. He said, anyone who drinks of this water shall test again. He said, woman, you are involved in a false intimacy. But anyone who drinks of the water I shall give him shall never test again. Jesus is the only one who can bring that into our soul and cure us and heal us. So, the good part. Now let's talk about the cure. I do a very simple solution because it's in the Bible. How do we, how do we overcome this? And for some of you, it's going to be a long journey. The first thing, I want you to write it down. You need to surrender your heart to God completely. Don't be afraid. You need to come and say, God, as broken as it is, as messed up as it is, as wounded as it is, people have treated this, but can I trust you with my heart so that I can get healing? You got to go somewhere. And he said, I came to bind the broken heart. And I come to turn ashes into beauty. He can turn things around. It's not the will of God that you and your wife, for example, should live like roommates. That's not relationship. That is a roommate. That is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Airbnb. The difference is that your husband doesn't pay rent. It's a free, it's a lifetime Airbnb. There, there must be something more than that. And there is. And you need to say, God, this heart has been wounded so much, I don't trust anybody. Will you today take this heart and do a work? He will. I, I promise you he will. Intimacy begins with God. We lost intimacy with God at the beginning. And the only way we can get it back is back to the garden. Going back to God with our nakedness, and say, God, I'm not ashamed. I want to become vulnerable to you. Some of you need to cry unto God. Some of you need to spend this week in the presence of God and say, God, I am tired. I am tired of living in a prison. I'm tired of not able to receive love and not able to give love. Will you touch my heart? Touch my heart. Heal me. I'm afraid, but I come, God. 
The only person who can handle your heart so gently is Jesus. You can trust him. I can tell you, I trusted him with my heart and I've never been disappointed. He can handle with gentle, gentleness, with wisdom and anointing. And above all, with love. I say love. This man can love you more than anybody can. So he says, those barriers that you have set for yourself and emotional barriers, spiritual barriers, this is what he says in Revelation 3. He says, I stand at that barrier right now. He said, right now I stand at that barrier and I'm knocking. If you hear my voice and open that door, I will come in and I will share a meal together as friends. Can you trust God? Because he's standing at the barrier. That heart that has been shut. He wants to do healing. Some of you, you don't even have a relationship with him at all. I'm going to give you an opportunity if you're here to say, God, I've never trusted you. I've been afraid even to trust you. But today I want to surrender my life to you. Let the journey begin. And when he comes in, I can guarantee you that he will fill your heart with love. You can love again. You know, I, like I told you begin, I come from a place where I think I'm, I can boldly say that, and my wife can testify, I'm, not, I'm one of the most romantic men now in the world. <laughs> Amen. Both in my relationship with my wife and with the church. I believe I love you really care. You know why? Because God has healed my heart. That I can trust people. I was having a conversation with somebody this week and the person was talking. He said, with all the disappointment you've gone in your life, people betraying you, why do you continue to trust people again? I said, I can't help it. Because love is the essence. Love is not, love is God. And God can't but love. And when that love confronts you, even when people treat you like nothing and they abuse you, you can't help but just love again. That's what he does. That's the, the wonderful work, the miraculous power of Christ in our hearts. That when he does that heart, and some of you, you are, not, you are saying, God, don't mend it, repair it. No, no, he's not going to mend or repair. He's going to give you a new heart. God looks at your heart and says, boy, it's really messy. I don't know who did this, who did that. See all these holes and abuse. God said, no, 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 no. Put this one aside. I'm going to give you a brand new heart. That's what he promised. He said, he will give you a new heart. He said, let's start again. You can love again. Take the barriers. Number two. You need to <laughs> seek counseling wholeheartedly. Some of the situation goes beyond just prayer. And prayer is the beginning. But some of you need sometimes to sit with trusted people. People who are sometimes professionals. Sometimes people who are good at this. Who can help you sort some of it out. Sometimes we need a healing walk. Even with the woman at the well. Jesus did not say, okay, let's go. If, if you read that passage carefully, look at John chapter 4. Watch this. So Jesus is talking to this woman, and there's beginning, her eyes is beginning to open. He said, okay, 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 I will do it. I will open my heart. But he said, please. The woman said, give me this water. That I will never be thirsty again. What did Jesus say? That I will not come in to get water. He said, go get your husband. You know what Jesus is saying? Let's talk about your past. Sometimes it is necessary. This is not for everybody. Sometimes we need to go back to the past and walk. I did that. You know my story. I needed to go back when I was eight years old with my soccer ball to walk that journey back for healing. Some of you may not need that. Sometimes God will bring healing completely. You come to him like this morning with your heart and there's no need for counseling, but God will just come and boom, the power of his love it can just turn everything around. And I cannot explain why some of us do. Some of us Every day is a healing walk. And maybe that walk may take you five years, six years, ten years, but you got to walk it. Or oh, can I give the final one? 
Number three, you need to step out confidently. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to love again. Don't be afraid. The Bible says in John 4, verse, 1 John 4, 18, I believe. I, I think I made a mistake there, 1 John. There's no fear in love, but perfect love. That's how we fear. Say, God, deliver me from this fear of intimacy so that at least I can let people in, even for coffee. Let's start from there. And you can be blunt and say, you know what? I can go out for coffee, but that's all I can take right now. Is that okay? Let's set the ground rules. That's all I can. Even to go out for coffee with you, for me, is a big step. But I need to take it. But you got to start from somewhere. Take some risk, but obviously take God-approved risk. I'm not asking you to go and give your heart to everybody. You need to give your heart to people that you sense. God is saying, this is okay. With prayer, with seeking God, God will give you that freedom to start trusting people again. Finally, 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, love always. Love always. Love trust. Always trust. Always hopes. Always perseveres. We are going to begin a journey today, and I want to encourage you with all my heart, don't stop. Keep going. Along the way, some people will be snobbish. They may remind you about your rejection, abandonment, but love always. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Will you stand up with me right now? Holy Spirit. I'm going to give some quiet moment. Holy Spirit, begin to do a work in our hearts. And where, where is your intimacy ratio? Your intimacy quotient. Where do you rate yourself? Um, does intimacy annoy you? Does it bother you? Does it make you feel awkward? Or simply, are you afraid? Give your fear to God right now. Say, God, this is where I am. I know I can do more. Some of you are married. You know you can do better. But you're afraid. Sometimes you don't even know how. Talk to him. Some of you have siblings you have never spoken to. Some of you have parents that your relationship is, relationship is a bit awkward because there was no intimacy at home. You, you don't even know if your dad if calls you and says, I love you, it is awkward for you. Your relationship, even the community of the, the believers, and above all, your relationship with God. Say, God, I don't even know what your love looks like. I, I don't know what it looks like. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. I'm going to step aside and just talk to God. Whisper to God from the very depth of your heart. Every, any area that God has spoken to you, that you need improvement, you need help, he's right there with you. The Bible says he's a friend. You're a friend of God. You want to come into your heart. He wants you to open that door. He wants to have some intimate relationship with you.